Let's start with the most common medication on the market, metformin. It's first line treatment after a diagnosis of type 2. Plenty of studies have shown its effects in decreasing blood glucose levels and potentiating the effects of insulin, but a full picture of its mechanisms of action still eludes us. Here are three things we know it does. It decreases output of glucose from the liver, it decreases absorption of glucose from the GIT, and it increases glucose uptake in skeletal muscle cells. And most of this is thought to occur via its action on AMPK, an enzyme that plays an important role in cellular energy management. Sulfonylureas are next in line. These have a well-defined mechanism of action. So this outline here is a pancreatic beta cell, and this is an ion channel specific for potassium. If ATP hops on here, the channel is closed, and if a sulfonylurea hops on, it'll have the same effect. Closing this channel leads to a buildup of potassium inside the cell, and because there's now a higher proportion of cations in the cell, the charge will become less negative overall, closer to the charge outside of the cell, and hence the cell will depolarize. Depolarization causes these calcium channels to open up, allowing calcium to rush into the cell. An influx of calcium in a pancreatic beta cell causes secretion of insulin. As a quick summary, sulfonylurea is the second line type 2 diabetes oral agent increase the amount of insulin released by beta cells. After trying these both, if the patient's HbA1c still doesn't look much good, you can add a third oral therapy. The options are broader here. We'll start with the glyptins. To understand how these work, we need to know about glucagon-like peptide, or GLP-1. When certain food hits the GIT, GLP-1 gets released from cells in the gut wall then heads to the pancreas to stimulate the release of insulin. Which sounds great, but after its release, GLP-1 is quickly degraded by an enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4, or DPP-4. The glyptins inhibit this enzyme and thus increase the presence of GLP-1. Next up in the recommendations are the gliflozins. These inhibit a transporter in the kidney called sodium glucose cotransporter 2 or SGLT2. This transporter is one of the key players responsible for getting glucose back into the blood after it's been filtered into the nephron tubules. If you block that transporter, you'll end up with less glucose in the blood and more being peed out. You ripper. The way I like to remember it is this drug flows in and glucose flows out in your urine. The next recommendation is an easy one to comprehend. They essentially act as analogs for GLP-1, who we mentioned before. They are the tides, such as liraglutide. They copy the action of glucagon-like peptide and that's why we give them names like liraglutide. The algorithm I'm following only recommends the, the following two drugs if the others are contraindicated, but I will chuck them in here for completeness. So we've got acarbose, a drug that inhibits an enzyme called alpha-glucosidase. Alpha-glucosidase usually breaks down long chains of carbohydrates to a size which can then be absorbed through the intestine wall and into the blood. The problem with this drug is that if you block this enzyme, you've got these long chain carbohydrates going straight through you, and this leads to the adverse drug effects of flatulence in 78% of people who take the drug. So you can understand why it's not that popular. Okay, and lastly, the glitazones, which also go by the unpronounceable name of thiazolid, thiazolid, 
thiazolidinodions, or TZDs. I'm never going to say that again. These activate a nuclear receptor, which promotes transcription of genes relating to the metabolism of carbohydrates, the utilization of energy. So they encourage cells to use glucose for their oxidative purposes, thereby reducing the amount in the circulation. The glitazones were shown to have an association with increased fluid retention and have thus fallen out of favour a few years ago. So as of 2017, that's it for oral diabetic medications. Remember, algorithms like this can be useful, but risk providing prescribers a formula to be relied on over patient-specific care. Okay, thanks for watching. Hit subscribe and we'll see you next time.